This video is about programming the PEG Solitaire game in APL using object-oriented programming. To know more about the game and see an example of programming the game in a non-object-oriented manner, you should check the video Programming the PEG Solitaire in APL. This will help you understand the basics of the game. Assuming you know what the game is all about, you can see it as an array of cells or squares, each one being an instance of a class which reacts to a mouse click. Looking at it that way, each cell would then be responsible to update itself and other cells depending on the state of the board. Let's explore this avenue. Let's build a class called Square, which will be based on the static object which has properties like background color, border, and so on. We can add a property, State, which will tell in which of two states the square is in, filled or empty. Actually, we can add a third state, Forbidden, which will denote a square where we cannot play. The class square will also contain another object, a circle, which will be used to show the state of a square. For example, when a square is filled in, just like this. We will also need to write a method, let's call it select, which will be used to do something when a square is clicked. Okay, let's look at the square class. It will be based on a static object. A static object is used to display graphics in a sub-window, like a form. So let's create a form and a static object into it. There we go. It has size. We can change it. It has a position. We can change it. It has a background color, a border, and many other properties, like it's visible. Let's bring it back. We can draw a circle into it. Let's see if we can create a class from it. First of all, Let's edit square. Square is a class that I have just created. It is based on a static object. We have the name here, followed by the colon, which separates it from its base class, here, static. And then we have the constructor of the class. Here we call the static object's constructor, using our own constructor argument. This is where we specify if we want a border, the background color, the position, the size, and so on. Then we create a circle which we center in the square. Then we set the square and the circles callback function to our own select function, which will be described below. Then we set the state of the square to be filled. Filled is a constant, like empty. It has the value 1, just like empty has the value 0, and there's a few more constants defined here. State is a property that we made up. All it does when set is to change its state to the value given and change its color accordingly. It also sets the square's visible property. For example, if we set the state to 2, we change the circle's color to red and make the square visible. If we set it to forbidden, which has the value 3, it doesn't matter which color we give it, but we give it 1 anyway. Finally, the callback function select flips its state from filled to empty. Let's try it. First, we create a new form. It's 300 by 300, and we keep it on top for this video. Next, we create a square using the square class that we just created. Let's trace into it. So, Control Enter, and we see the tracer window come up. We enter the constructor, pass on any argument to the static constructor. There weren't any here, so all it does is create the square. The square is visible by default. Then we create a black circle. Then we set the callback function for the mouse up event to our own select function, both for the circle and the square. And then finally, we set the state to filled. Now, this is a property. Even though we assigned a constant to state, what happens here is that we will call the set function for the state property. Watch this. Control Enter to trace into it, and we get into the set function. Now, we set the state to the new value, and we can see that the new value is 1, just like we had filled. Then we set its visible property to the fact that it's different from forbidden. State is not forbidden, therefore it will stay visible. Then finally we put the fill color to the color associated with that state. In this case it's going to be black. It's not going to change anything. Then we exit this function, we exit the constructor, we're back into the workspace. Now we have a circle displays in a square. But wait, there's better. Since we put a callback on mouse up event, which flips the color when clicked, we can click on the square and see it change. Watch this. We click, changes to empty. We click again, and it changes to filled. And we can go over here, check for its state. It's filled. I click again, check for its state again, and now it's zero. It's empty. 
We can also set it into session. We can make it empty. We can even make it red. And we can even make it invisible. Let's put it back. Let's change its position. Let's change its size. Let's build an array of them. In this statement here, what we do is we set an array of cells of 4 by 5. And for each one of the 4 by 5 cells, we build a square of 50 by 50, whose position will be dependent on the indices that we've given there. So watch this. We now have an array of 4 by 5 squares, each one of which can be clicked and modified. Now, the problem with this is that the lines are a little bit too close together. So what we're going to do, we're just going to make them overlap by one pixel. That looks better already. Let's click on them again. Yeah, still works. Okay, what is the state of each one of these cells in this array? You can see 1 and 0 is where it's filled and empty. What are the cells? Well, we can see that each one of them is an instance of a square in an instance of a form. That's not very nice. What we can do is change the display form of each one of the cells, and then we can ask for them, and nah, that's not really nice, though. What we should do is have a circle when it's empty and a dark circle when it's filled. So how about this? What we do now is that we ask for the cell state, which was a bunch of ones and zeros there, and we index that into the array of circle and log, and we set the display form of each cell to one of these two characters. So now if we ask for it, we can see that some of them are circles, some of them are logs. So it mimics what we see on the form. So what we're going to do, we're going to change the state property so that it will set the display form for the cell that is involved when it's clicked. So let's edit square, and we're just going to add something here that says change the display form to either a circle, a log, a mark to say that it's selected, or a space if it's forbidden, depending on the state. Let's try that. Let's redefine the cells and try again. We can ask for the cells. Yep, it's been set automatically. Okay, so now we've proven that this is feasible. Let's see if we can make a function to create the board. Here we have a function. Control enter, now line 0, we work in origin 0, we set the pattern, and the pattern is going to be like this. Well, you see where the zeros are is where it's going to be forbidden, and 1 is where we want to play. The start position, the size, the shape, the position of each one of the cells, then we build the board just like we did before. We now have a form, we build the cells, now we have a 7 by 7. We can click on each one of them, they're all ready to go. And what we're going to change is the state of all of them, all in one go. The pattern tells us which ones are valid and which ones are not. So where it is valid, we're going to keep it filled with a 1. And where it is not valid, we're going to change the state to 3, which is forbidden. So as we do this, all the ones that are forbidden became invisible. And now we set the middle to nothing, and we're ready to go. We now have a game that answers our clicks. It flips every time we click on one of them. We could actually play with this game here. All we would have to do is play, make sure that, for example, if I want to play here, I can remove this one, put it there, remove this one in between. But there's nothing that prevents me from playing anywhere. What we want to do next is verify that the moves are valid. How are we going to do this? Let's have a look. It basically boils down to modifying select. But before writing select, we need to review what happens when we click a square. Making a move is a two-step operation. One, you select the square to move from, and two, you select the square where you want to go to. In order to be a valid move, some conditions must be met. First, the initial square must be filled in. Second, the target square must not be filled in. And finally, the square in between must be filled in also. We can supply a square instance with information about valid moves. For example, we can give it a list of neighbor squares, which can be jumped over and landed to. In this example here, this square has two possible moves. This one and this one. We could provide it with a list of pairs of cells 
where it can jump over and move to. With this information provided, the select method can verify if, in the case of the first click, it itself, where it's been clicked, is filled in, and in the case of the second click, if itself is empty, and the square in between the first click and the second click is filled. If these two clicks are valid, the select method can then update the board by updating the states of the three squares involved. That means, of course, that we must record somewhere where the first click was made. Let's make a first pass at the class. In order to be able to determine what a valid move is, we'll experiment a bit with matrices of indices. Here is the 7 by 7 of indices. Each cell contains its row and column indices. If we look at cell 3, 2, we can compute the cells next to it in this fashion. There are four of them. If we want to find the cells two away, we can simply add the double. In fact, in APL it is simple to find both, this way. But not all are valid. Here we can see that there are some negative values for the cell 0, 2. And in the case of 6, 2, we can see that we have rows that go beyond 6. We have rows 7 and rows 8. If we produce a mask of all the valid locations and expand it to include invalid rows and columns, we can check if moves are valid or not. We expand the mask once, we expand it twice, and we have two outer layers of zeros. We can now check if position 0, 2 is valid simply by indexing into the mask. We have to add 2 to reposition it into the valid mask. Now we can check if they are all valid, and we can do it for all positions. We now get a 7 by 7 of 4 by 2s. It's a four-dimensional array. We can produce the list of all valid masks for each one of the cells. And for each cell, we can display all the moves that are possible. Using the mask, we can produce all the valid moves for each one of the cells. Let's create a function find valid moves that will encapsulate all this work. Here we have the function. It does exactly the same thing as we've been doing so far. It takes a mask of active cells. It creates an extended mask by adding layers of zeros twice around it. Then we find all the moves that are possible for each one of the cells. Then we find the valid mask for each one of the cells. And finally, we extract only the ones that are valid. We will now modify the square class to include this. The first modification is to add a field, next, that will hold all the valid cells that can be jumped over and landed to. This will be a two-column matrix, just like the ones we've created so far. The second modification will be in the select function. We now require two clicks to make a move. The first one selects the square to move from, the second one selects the square to move to. So, if the first move hasn't been recorded, move 1 is empty, then if, and only if, the square is filled, we record the move and mark the cell selected. If it is not the first move, we verify that this call is one of the calls we are allowed to go to. If it is the case, and the cell we jump over is filled, and the cell we land to is empty, we reset the cell we came from in move 1 to empty, the cell we jumped over to empty, and the cell we jumped to to filled, and then we remove the first move. If this is not a valid second move, we reset the first move state to filled, and we forget that move. We need to modify the program to play the game too. This only happens at the end. So we only need to determine the list of valid moves for each cell and set the first move to not set yet, empty in other words. Okay, let's trace through it. Quadrio zero, pattern, same as before, starting position, size, shape, rows and columns of each cell. We build a board, each cell, we set up the game, starting position, we find all the valid moves, we set the next cell to each one of these. So each cell now has its next valid moves defined. They're matrices of two columns. And then we set the initial move to nothing. We are now ready to play the game. 
So now, the first move is, yes, it's selected. Of course, we can't play anywhere with this, but it has been selected. It has done exactly what we've told it to do. We can click anywhere now, it doesn't matter, it's going to be reset. The only place where it's going to work is if I click here, and if I click here right after. If I click on a valid selection at the beginning, like I could play here now, but if I play, for example, here, then it doesn't work and it resets itself. So it is working. This game is working. It is validating the moves that we're making. But we can do better yet. We will make one improvement in this class. When the select method is used, there is no point in allowing to click on a square when we cannot play from there. So after we've checked that this is a filled square, we will check that there's at least one move which is filled and empty. Now if I click here, for example, this is not a valid move. It is filled, but it, it's not a move where I can play from. Nothing happens. If I click here, yeah, it's ready. If I can now click here, it will take it. I could also play here. I could play there. I could play here. These, these are the only three moves I can play at the moment. If I try here again, nothing happens. If I try here, yeah, it works. If I try to click anywhere else at the moment, it's going to be disabled. This is an improvement, but we can do even better. There's no reason why I need to click twice once I click here. There's only one place where we can go, it's here. So we can make the selection smart enough to just play right away and not force us to click a second time. This will be the final improvement. In this last version, we've made one final improvement. When we click on a cell, if it is filled, and we know that there is only one place where we can go, then we don't need to wait for the user to click on the second cell. Since we know there is only one, we can right away set it to empty and filled and set our own state to empty. Otherwise, if there is more than one, then we keep proceeding as we did before. And this is the final improvement. Let's see what happens. Now, if we click on one cell for which there is only one move, then now it does it right away. So we only click here. There is only one place to play. If we try to click on a cell that doesn't make any sense, nothing happens. If we click on a cell for which there are multiple choices, now it keeps playing as in the last version we had. And we now must select either this one or this one. We must select one of the valid moves. If I click here, for example, then it disables it. We have to click on a cell that is valid. OK, we've got all the pieces now. We can put them all together under a single class. There is a constructor, something to initialize the game. We have the find valid moves function. We have the embedded square class uh, with its own select method and its state property. So we should be able to um, try it. Let's run it. This is exactly the same code as we had before. It's been put under a single roof. I called it Peg Solitaire OO, and it's got everything that we've done so far. If we try it, we can see that it behaves exactly the way the other one was working before. This one even has a twist, a special case. We've got this European Peg Square format. And the class will take an argument, which will be the pattern of the peg solitaire board. And as you can see, it has a slightly different format. There are extra squares in the corners here. So, same procedure. There's just more squares to play with. I hope you enjoy this. See you next time.